welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Got butyrate? Well, this stuff is actually that good. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know I love this gut health boosting postbiotic called butyrate. In my upcoming book, Unlocking the Keto Code, I'll reveal how butyrate is quite the rock star for many reasons, including optimizing your mitochondrial function. And my special guest today, John Ede, Chief Science Officer and co-founder of Pendulum, is also a big butyrate fan. In fact, he's built a career around it by researching genomic technology and the microbiome for over two decades. Today, he's going to give us a fascinating 411 on all things butyrate. So stay tuned, because we'll also discuss why this special postbiotic is so essential for wellness and how to make sure your body produces enough of it so you live a long, healthy life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Dr. Gundy Podcast. John, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited. So I'm really excited to talk to you all about butyrate, which is one of my favorite postbiotics. So can you give us a brief overview of your research over the past two decades? Certainly. Uh, and actually, let me first start maybe with framing it with a question. Um, what makes progress in biology and medicine hard? Um, I believe that it's because the purely reductionist approach doesn't work uh, there. Biology is one of those areas where if you split the system down, if you try and reduce it to a simpler part, the magic disappears. Or worse, the thing you're looking at is not really the phenomena that's relevant uh, at, the, at, at the full complexity. Um, so a lot of the work that I've um, been involved with is on the technology side, how to create cutting edge technology that allows you front row seats that doesn't disturb the show. Um, and I, so I've oscillated between the technology uh, aspect and the biological questions of interest. So my background is in applied physics. I got my undergrad in, at Cornell, PhD at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and postdoc at Harvard. And my first job, I joined a startup, uh, which then subsequently went public, that was revolutionizing the way DNA sequencing was being done. Where literally, we were watching the DNA polymerase, the, the, the little copying machine that's in all of our cells, as it was putting each of the bases in, exactly. Uh, and then it turns out that this was actually pretty critical uh, for our next sleep, which was to, to go into the microbiome, because the complexity of the microbiome requires kind of this high resolution way uh, of looking at things. Um, and so uh, I, this is where I met Colleen and Jim, and uh, we founded Pendulum. And for the last decade or so, we've been creating, characterizing, and producing microbiome-based health solutions. So a lot of, I think you you talk and a lot of us talk about the microbiome uh, being considered uh, being a garden and we should think about pre and pro and postbiotics in this garden setting um, explain that for everybody listening and watching definitely um i really like the garden analogy because i think it it flows nicely to explain all three of those parts. So in the garden analogy, the, the plants are the probiotics. Uh, and then the soil and nutrients and sun and water would be the prebiotics that feed the plants. And then the all important postbiotics are the fruit and vegetables that those plants produce. Uh, and that that then nourishes you and uh, creates a vibrant ecosystem. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but for many, many, many years, really up until recently, we had no idea that uh, this microbiome, number one, even existed. Uh, and number two, was actually producing, uh, in your analogy, fruits and vegetables. Uh, yeah. So postbiotics yeah. are actually a rather recent uh, discovery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, I mean, it, it, exactly to your point, I mean, it's actually astonishing to me that we've gotten as far as we have uh, without recognizing the importance of the microbiome. And I think now we're going to kind of kick ourselves looking back and say, like, how how is it possible that something that um, has that this 
incredible chemistry capacity could have been overlooked for so long. So wh when did you first come to learn about pre and postbiotics? Did you, I mean, did you stumble on this coming, coming from a genomic background or? Mm -hmm. No, ex exactly. Um, I mean, I, so I'm going to be honest to say, like the 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 term postbiotic, I actually only heard about it recently. So I myself also have, have come to speak on kind of the latest terminology for it. But now we've been per referring to it as metabolites, and it was, you know, in, from our perspective, kind of the central launching point. So we started with the knowledge of well, what metabolite do we want? What's the thing that seems to differentiate between? Uh, healthy and disease, and from there work backwards. Kind of the, so the the garden analogy is um, we need more tomato. You know we need to produce more tomatoes. We need more tomato plants. What kind of varieties of, of tomato plants do we, are we going to have? And then from there pairing it with the right prebiotics that are going to work well to nourish those particular strains. So that brings us to I guess one of your my favorite subjects, butyrate. So there, um, what in, there's lots of postbiotics, and we could talk about mm -hmm. all of them. There's probably 10 more that have been discovered today while you and I are talking. But um, yeah. what, what, intrigue, what intrigues you, what intrigued you about butyrate? Well, it, what's amazing about butyrate is, I mean, it's the currency of the gut. It's literally the fuel for the colonocytes, for the, for the gut cells. Um, but for us, what, what was specifically it, uh, amazing is that it seemed uh, correlated, you know, low amounts of it seemed to be correlated with metabolic syndrome. Uh, so we were seeing that there was a reduced uh, amount of butyrate and of the strains that produce it in those that suffered from diabetes. Uh, and so that's, that's what kind of triggered uh, the entire research program that we, that we started. So to create a formulation that could restore that uh, and then couple that formulation with the necessary prebiotic to, to enable that to, to grow and flourish when, um, when given. So let's, let's back up for a second because I've, I've written about uh, you know, butyrate being really essential fuel uh, for the lining of the gut, the colonocytes. But most people kind of say, wait a minute, uh, blood feeds these guys and they get all their nourishment from blood. But what, uh, what you're saying is, no, 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 these guys are absolutely dependent on a short chain fatty acid uh, for their fuel, right? That's, a, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. Uh, and, and there are various studies showing that you know, kind of to have the health of your lining be there, that, that nourishment needs to be there uh, at, at significant quantities. Um, so it's, it's important to, to, to create the ecosystem that enables that supply uh, to be high enough. Uh, because I think what, what ends up happening is that, you know, that ecosystem can be fragile depending on um, your diet and other assaults on it that can result in a much more kind of diminished version of that. Yeah. So in your research, is there a way to actually measure how much butyrate production that, that we produce or an animal produces, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just earlier this month, we published a study in BMC Microbiology, where we measure butyrate both in the stool and in plasma. Uh, and we demonstrated that participants, you know, that received PGC had increased levels of butyrate, uh, significant actually to the order of 20 to 40% increase. Um, and so we believe this is the first demonstration of a probiotic intervention that is able to uh, increase the levels and, and see that not just in stool, but in, in plasma directly. And I might add that, you know, as, as much as potentially 10% of all our, our energy production in us uh, can come from, from butyrate. So it's, it's not a uh, marginal player. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Okay. So, uh, good question. How would someone know if they're making butyrate or not? That's a great question. Um, I, I would say that our focus was on uh, the effect that that had, the reduced amount of butyrate on your, body, your body's ability to handle blood glucose spikes. So, we were measuring its effect um, 
using you know traditional uh, kind of A1C measures, but also kind of the more uh, modern continuous glucose monitors. So you can actually watch then with a specific meal and and watch it for the same foods that you had a different level of spike, uh, you know, before and after. Um, but actually, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this because I, I know that you've 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 seen uh, a, a wider variety of of effects in a clinical setting. Yeah, what I I think most people I don't think can feel the effect of butyrate. I don't think they go, oh my gosh, I'm really low on butyrate today. Uh, I, I need to you know, have, some more, have some more fiber in my diet today. Uh, I guess that's what I was gonna get at. Or mm -hmm. you, can't, um, you can't fart and smell the butyrate, uh, for example. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, no, no, e exactly right. It's not something that you, you would be able to tell kind of intrinsically this is this is part of this complexity you 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 would need some downstream indicator um and i can imagine that that, that butyrate will will be shown to have other roles and so once people make that connection uh to some other um uh, measurable uh, clinical quantity then then that will also be trackable gotcha so uh are speaking of which are there foods that we should be eating that can stimulate butyrate production. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, our, our initial focus on this was uh, very much on the formulation itself. What would be good to couple with it? What prebiotic uh, would, would work well there? And we tested a variety and landed on uh, inulin, which is a fiber. Um, but we also, we know that there's kind of a holistic view of, of, of health and how you'd move it forward besides taking the particular formulation. So our nutritionists, for example, um, ask, you know, tell people that they should attempt to, to get kind of an overall increase in fiber intake generally. Um, that, that in and of itself has been shown to, to help on a number of fronts and to help increase the chances of the, the, these particular set of strains, the butyrate producing strains in, to thrive in the garden. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of inulin and inulin-containing vegetables. In fact, I just had a big uh, radicchio and other chicory uh, vegetable salad last night, uh, and the the chicory family is just loaded with inulin. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes, some people call them sunchokes, are a great source. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's easier than a lot of people think to to get uh, inulin. And you can get it in powder form. Um, mm -hmm. It has a, mm -hmm. it does have a, you know, slight sweet taste, and you can yeah. actually use it as a sweetener. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, most people I think now know that the word butter actually comes from butyrate uh, because there is a little butyric acid in butter. Mm -hmm. So everybody, I'm sure, wonders: Should we be eating a stick of butter every day, like? some of my uh, colleagues and in health influencing say? <laughs> well, that sounds, sure sounds delicious. Um, well, I, <laughs> I would say, so for the, for the effect that we were after, there are very specific cells and specific areas of the GI that you need to get the butyrate to. Um, these are these L cells, because that would then start the cascade of signaling to prepare your body for the oncoming um, glucose load. Uh, and I'm going to steal an analogy that uh, my co-founder Colleen came up with, which I really like, which is um, if you had a million dollars in a suitcase and you needed to get it to a specific place in order to get a project started, say like a clinic or something, and uh, would you A, deliver the suitcase directly where it needs to go, or B, open the suitcase up somewhere along the road and call the person up and say, hey, it's somewhere here, you know, go and collect it. Um, this is similar to the situation with butyrate because it, it, in essence, it is utilized everywhere in the GI. Uh, so if you need it to, to get to a specific location to do a very specific action, you need to find a way to deliver it there. Uh, and that's the power of um, the strains. So the, the probiotic strains, in essence, are like a white glove delivery service. Um, and so th this gets around the problem that, for example, a butyrate supplement would also have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, people are, are probably unaware 
that you, you can buy butyrate as a supplement, but most of us working in this field have been very unimpressed with the delivery. How's that? Yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Because th that aspect of the problem is not trivial at all. Uh, so this, this comes back to that very thing about the complexity of biology. You, you can know that a particular molecule is really great, but unless it's in the right place at the right time, uh, an effect that could otherwise be very helpful uh, might dissipate entirely. So how is it, do you think, uh, or your research showing that, that butyrate is actually able to modulate me metabolism, like you know, maintain a healthy weight without really trying? Right, well, we believe that basically this is the upstream part of something that has been you know, very well studied. So um, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, there's already been uh, great advances on the downstream part of how sugar metabolism is taken care of, which is with this GLP-1 uh, pathway. And so we know that your body sends out that, that hormone to, to, to tell your pancreas, hey, send some insulin to take care of this. Um, interestingly, you know, people hadn't then gone to the next step above that. Where, where did the signaling from the gut come from? Uh, and so this is the part that we, we travel down is what, what is happening in the gut that, that initiates the, the set of signaling that's going to happen that will then result in glucose control. And so we recognize that, you know, short chain fatty acids and specifically butyrate were part of that initial signaling that then helps, uh, those, those L cell tells those L cells, Hey, release GLP one and tell the rest of the body to get ready. And so. Uh, and again, you just can't, I want to reiterate, you can't just swallow butyrate and tell the body to get ready to handle glucose. No, exactly, because it, the, the connection has to be with these specific cells. Uh, and uh, they are concentrated in some parts of the, of the GI, like near the ileum. They're, they're all along the GI, but there are some areas of concentration. And it's thought that you, you might have a, a network of strains that are interacting with and creating this kind of host signaling, bacterial signaling back and forth. Uh, and so this is one of the ways to attempt to turn on that signaling or make sure to restore it back to kind of the healthy state that it was in. I always like to ask the question, what's in it for the bacteria to do this signaling? In other words, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think the 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 thought is, and and uh, I mean, certainly, kind of my my impression of it is, the the strains also get a really good part of the deal. They get they get to be in a nice environment with a lot of resources kind of flooding their way, uh, and so what's happened over time is as kind of a established a system or a network that 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 enables that to work in harmony. Um, and I think this is the part I think that is maybe um, not as appreciated, how much kind of our, you know, us as an organism requires this other ecosystem to, to function in a healthy fashion. I think, you know, for, for the longest time, I mean, I think since the moment of the invention of antibiotics, which was an amazing breakthrough for us, I think we've generally thought of, you know, the only good bacteria are dead bacteria, right? And it's now the realization that like that's couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, in fact, it's really kind of the, the, these pathogenic bacteria are kind of the bad apples that give all the rest of them a really bad name. But, the, but you actually generally um, live quite well and rely on the services provided by, by the strains. And they in turn rely on you to uh, provide them a home and nutrients and um, the right ecosystem. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the typical uh, Western diet is not holding up our end in providing these guys what they need to help us. Exactly right, exactly right. Um, so things that are, you know, uh, processed and high in sugars and fats um, and very low in fiber, um, all of those things are contributing to, to changing that, that ecosystem. And in fact, I mean, it's, it's, 
quite natural to imagine, uh, just as you would see kind of in, in the world around when ecosystem diversity, you know, uh, falls off because of changes in the environment, right? Because you you change the, the nutrient landscape or you change the way that it's, it's, it's interacted with. All right, let's go on to uh, my favorite bug, Acromancia, uh, Mucinophila. And congratulations for your whole team on your phenomenal work of of capturing this probiotic strain, Acromancia, in a stable pill form. Uh, and I actually, I, I tell all my patients Thank about you. your supplement, and I'm already uh, seeing some really cool things uh, happening with, with several of them on their subsequent blood tests. Uh, so awesome. uh, I also, I've been writing about this probiotic, my books, but tell the listeners what's so cool about this strain great yeah of course um well so acromantia holds a very special place uh in, in the gut because it's allowed to interact directly with your gut lining uh, in fact it utilizes the mucin in your lining as its energy source um, and to tie into your earlier question well why does why does the body allow that uh, and, and the reason is because the postbiotics that acromantia produces are then very helpful both for you and for the kind of beneficial uh, set of strains that your body would like to flourish near, uh, near, near the gut lining. So it can be thought of as a keystone species, sort of a linchpin for the health and function of your microbial garden. And, you know, some people um, associate mucus with, oh, runny nose or phlegm. But in fact, uh, mucus in the lining of the gut is, is probably the most important thing we've got. And I'm interested in it because it actually traps lectins. Um, mm. They are sugar-seeking molecules, and mucus is mucopolysaccharides, lots of sugars. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you know, and I know, that the, the thicker this lining of mucus, uh, the better off we are. That's exactly right, because then that prevents a whole host of issues uh, which are to do with kind of a more permeable lining, which allows a lot of things to get across that shouldn't, and then can result in a state of inflammation and other reaction in your body uh, downstream. Yeah, we've, uh, you know, my, my interest is in, in leaky gut, and it's, uh, it is a, we have an epidemic of leaky gut, but even Hippocrates 2,500 years ago said all disease begins in the gut, so, yeah. and he didn't have our test to prove it, but he was, he was obviously right. Yeah, so, no, he, he nailed it, for yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Acromancia has been known about for what, 12 years, maybe thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I've said to anyone who listen, it's been the holy grail of probiotics. Why has it been so difficult to grow this guy, make a sh shelf stable supplement until now? How'd you guys crack the code? Right. Well, uh, there, there, you know, I would summarize it as there are two major hurdles uh, for scaling it up. One is the fact that it's a strict anaerobe. Um, so that means it's a type of strain that any minute amounts of oxygen are toxic for it. Um, in fact, like we literally measure it down to parts per million. Wow. Um, and so you have to get to get all of your process such that that uh, is removed from the system and from your, um, you know, production uh, uh, format. Uh, the other major issue with it is that it prefers to grow on media that is meat-based. It's not maybe too surprising since normally it would have uh, mucin there, but we managed to create a vegetable-based media uh, which can enable production uh, and especially kind of with a, with a regulatory landscape uh, be able to have a safe production method. Because as I recall Colleen saying, the FDA, because of mad cow disease and prions, <laughs> won't allow you to grow this bug uh, on what it would like to eat. 
Exactly right. Exactly right. So th th those kind of standardized media that's, that normally would be available in any microbiology lab, um, you know, because you can, for research purposes, no problem. You can grow it in, in whatever it's, it's happiest in. Uh, but, you know, we, in, at, from the start, we knew that if we needed to scale this up and have it be commercially viable, uh, then we needed to change it to, to be able to um, be just as effectively growing in a, in a vegetable media. So how, so how does Acromancia uh, help your body or help produce butyrate? What, mm -hmm. What's the mechanism? Yeah. Um, so what we and others have observed is that it, it actually really helps from a cross-feeding perspective. So it's kind of where postbiotics from one strain in essence serve as the prebiotics from the other and vice versa, and they're linked. Um, so Acromancia appears to be uh, especially synergistic with butyrate producing strains. So it itself doesn't produce uh, butyrate, but uh, it helps butyrate producing strains to flourish. And in fact, we've uh, seen in our own studies, uh, in our preclinical study, that uh, it actually helps a butyrate producing strain to engraft or stick around and thrive in the garden longer uh, when it's there versus when it's not. So we did the plus minus. Um, and additionally, it also produces the short chain fatty acid propionate, uh, which is connected to a number of beneficial health uh, effects similar to, to butyrate. In fact, there's some thought that it's the ratio of those two that's actually quite important. And so in this strain, I think a lot of people know that a lot of probiotics that we might swallow are actually not uh, normal flora. They're not denizens of, of our gut and they I tell people well they kind of go on vacation in your gut for a couple of weeks and then they pack up and leave uh, just to use that analogy but right. but this agromancia is actually the human gut strain right yes yes exactly and, and it's the one that um, normally you would have um, quite a high percentage of it so if you were to do a microbiome profiling after you know in, in stool you would you would see that uh it should be in there on its own at a couple percent which is pretty amazing given that there's hundreds to thousands of, of strains in your in your microbiome in, in total um but yeah it's it's this linchpin strain that is the kind of guardian at the uh at the lining to back up why, why do most of us not have that much acromancia? What, what's gone wrong? I mean, have we killed it with our antibiotics or have we killed it because it has nothing to eat? Or the, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the thought process? Well, I, I think it's probably a combination. Um, I think it's, it's a matter of the, uh, what you were mentioning earlier, the, the, the type of diet that, that we have, because that synergistic, uh, effect that it has or that that it connects with on the butyrate producers if you do things that reduce that community so you don't eat enough fiber for example then they don't there's not as much of those those plants out there so they don't provide uh the, the type of things that the acromantia needs uh, in order for it to thrive as well so there's there's kind of a complex community and i think we're only starting to scratch the surface about all the different ways it could go wrong gotcha um, now, one of your products uh, is called Glucose Control, and it has Acromancia, but it also has other bacteria. And mm -hmm. so why did you, so that, and that was designed from the get-go for type 2 diabetes, right? That's right. That's right. So how did you decide, well, we need more than just Acromancia to, to get what we want uh, to have this product help people. Right. Um, well, regarding the additional ingredients, we basically wanted uh, th this formulation to be self, uh, self-contained, entirely self-reliant, so not, not requiring a particular um, nutrient or other strain when it, when it arrives, because you know, different people taking it might have completely different microbiomes. So the way that we thought, thought about it is, well, we need to have the uh, the substrate that would be helpful. So that's why the inulin is there. Uh, then we have a bifido that helps to break down that substrate into um, 
uh, acetate, and then that can then be used by the butyrate producing strains that are in the formulation to produce butyrate. Uh, and we included a variety of butyrate producing strains to kind of cover the gamut of potential interactions that uh, might be there in, in different microbiomes. And then, of course, there's acromantia, which, as we know, synergistically uh, will interact with those uh, butyrate producing strains and is the one that is, is sort of uh, forming that bridge to to the lining. So all together, um, we thought that the, the that full combination enabled you to go from uh, the fiber to the butyrate and to the uh, effect of, of uh, the signaling in the body that's needed. So you can you you kind of eliminate the middleman and have every everybody that you need all in 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 a capsule. And, exactly right. And you've proven this to work in a clinical trial in humans. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. Pu and publish this data. That's right. That's right. And BMJ, this was uh, a couple of years ago uh, now, and, and that was very exciting for us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to, to us, that was one of the, the, the key moments is to demonstrate that uh, in a randomized control trial, uh, double blind to see to show that that effect um, because as, as you as you know there are a lot of things which in model systems can look good uh, but then they don't translate uh, in fact actually, one of my favorite quotes that I'm going to steal from our uh, chief medical officer Orville he said you know mice have been cured of diabetes a hundred times over <laughs> uh, and I think that that's exactly the the issue is finding a model system that points in the right direction but then demonstrating in people that you're you're having the t intended effect yeah, I uh, uh, just recently had uh, two, two patients who are actually very healthy individuals, but they, and they're, they're thin, but they, they run uh, elevated hemoglobin A1Cs, uh, higher than I like, let's put it that way, and uh, have some degree of insulin resistance, have elevated insulin, and I uh, talked them into trying glucose control, and we gave it we gave it two months, uh, and both of their hemoglobin A1Cs dropped. I think one of them dropped 0.7, and one of them dropped 0.6. But interestingly enough, uh, their insulin levels uh, came down into the normal range. And we've been, we've been trying a lot of manipulation to get that to happen. So this is the only thing that they changed. Um, and wow. so, and they were, they were delighted, uh, to, say the, to say the least. That's very exciting to hear. And, and I have to say, I, we are very interested to hear this type of, to, to hear all of the feedback, uh, especially of, you know, uh, what particular parameters moved and over what time frame. Uh, th this is all part of the thing that we're trying to build infrastructure for, to really understand um, the exact connection between people's responses uh, and for different formulations and different effects. Yeah, and um, I think I've, 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 I've posted on Instagram that um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in, in Italy in the south of France and I, I cheat when I'm over there and fully admit. Um, but I, and I take, in general, I take one of my products from Gundry MD, Lectin Shield, which absorbs lectins. And mm -hmm. I take a lot of it and I do very well. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this past fall, uh, I took some of your shelf stable acromancia mm -hmm. and i left my lectin shield behind on purpose and mm -hmm. i said okay we're gonna put this to the acid test and i uh, i actually was shocked i only had maybe a half a day where mm -hmm. i you know had some bowel issues but i went two weeks um absolutely no issues uh, which which actually it didn't surprise me but delightfully surprised me because mm -hmm. i had no backup mm -hmm. system uh, right. so right. that's just you know it's an experience of one but i i can tell you what would have happened if i didn't have that and didn't have lectin shield it would not have been pleasant for me or my wife let's put it that right. way right. no that that's that's really great to hear um and I'm, I'm, uh, I was surprised that you, you took the leap so fully. That's, that's very impressive. I know. It was really dumb in a way. But I said, <laughs> no, nah, we're, we're gonna, it's going to do it or it isn't going to do it. And I'm going to have no backup. So, 
Nice. nice. I'm, and I'm also I'm out trying to get most of my leaky gut patients, and I got a ton of them, uh, to and with autoimmune disease to get on uh, your Acromancia product. I I have that much uh, initial faith in it, and it'll be very interesting. We've just started that trial. It'll be very mm -hmm. interesting in the coming months to see if we can hasten the repair of leaky gut um, because it can be a very slow process. Uh, I used to think that I could seal somebody's leaky gut in a couple of weeks and I was naive. It can sometimes take up to a year to mm -hmm. finally mm -hmm. eliminate all the markers of leaky gut. But it'd be very, it'll be, it'll be very exciting to see if this guy is going to hasten that. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts or your work in, in your clinical patients that this is going to have an effect on leaky gut? Well, I would say that it's, it's really early days there. And it's, it's this kind of um, uh, feedback that we're, we're really interested in uh, making sure that we collate and, and bring back and think through what might be standardized uh, ways for us to, to observe this so that we can really track exactly where different people are getting the benefit. So, so now, so you have a shelf stable acromancia, and mm -hmm. then you have glucose control. Is so, is glucose control the uh, the Ferrari of the line and the high perform <laughs> the high performance product, or I mean, sh should you just be a type two diabetic to get the benefit of glucose control, or you know, who who should take what? Well, right. So I would say uh, if you've got diabetes, definitely PGC, uh, fenylglucosal is, is the right is the right product for you. Um, the thinking of it as the Ferrari, I think you know, then 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 I don't know. Then that kind of maybe leaves acromancia because I, I also like to think of that as a Ferrari too. I think it's just maybe uh, different different for different things. It's the entry um, level model. <laughs> 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 right. Um, it, I mean, I think the, the main thing is that we're just starting this journey of um, getting all the, the, the information in place. And, and PGC has basically this um, double blind uh, clinical trial behind it. And as we build up more of these studies going forward, and I think other formulations will um, also be able to make some more specific uh, recommendations. Gotcha. So what's what's next on the horizon uh, in microbiome advancement at Pendulum? I, I hear there's a new product in the pipeline. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, there is. Um, we've been working for a couple of years now uh, with Dr. Pesricha, uh, who heads up gastroenterology at Johns Hopkins, uh, and he has a preclinical model uh, where he's tested some of our formulations on. And he's been very excited by by the results. Uh, and so in the next couple of months, we were planning on releasing a, a gut uh, product and it would involve formulations, but also kind of this feedback loop to data so that we better understand who different formulations are working for. So almost like kind of a personalized uh, uh, approach. Because you can imagine somebody that suffers uh, from bloating might not need quite the same set of strains as somebody uh, that suffers from GI, from say maybe a, a pain uh, aspect. Right. And you think that you can actually uh, kind of custom formulate uh, these products for those needs? Well, we think that there can potentially be um, a, a couple of key uh, areas. Uh, so maybe those that suffer from loose bowels versus uh, those kinds of ways. And so then there may be just a, one specific type of formulation that, that works best in, the, in those scenarios. Something we haven't touched on, but is of interest to a lot of researchers, including myself and Dr. Daniel Amen, is the influence of the gut microbiome on mental health. Mm. And uh, we're, I think, with each passing year, we're realizing that uh, much of what we used to call 
uh, mental health disease isn't a disease, but it's a disturbance of our microbiome. Uh, is, is that anything in the future that Pendulum is going to look into, or who knows? Yeah, I mean, we, that, it's, that one has been, I mean, the gut-brain uh, uh, part is very exciting. And I think that that has come along uh, so fast in the last couple of years. Um, it isn't currently on our kind of nearer term horizon, but we've penciled in some kind of early thoughts on it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, put a crystal ball on exactly where that will be in, in, in a few years, except to say that I'm, I'm sure that that area is going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes so much sense so with, with, with what we're learning about how these how these gut buddies uh, really kind of control everything about us. Uh, it, yeah. it just makes sense. Uh, yeah, exactly. Most, uh, most humans don't like the thought that little one cell organisms might have that much control over, over us, but we just have to get over it. I mean. A absolutely. It's this thing of like, um, yeah, expanding your view, I like to think of it, of, of uh, your, yourself as being more of a, a super organism, right? Like there's, you're, you're more than just the, the cells that share exactly the DNA with you. You're, you're actually a full ecosystem and that's a good thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, well, it's been great having you on the program. Uh, you, I understand, have a special 20% offer for our audience with the code GUNDRY for your product. Yeah. Can you tell me how it works? Right. Uh, yeah, so anybody who uses the code GUNDRY will, will get that 20% uh, off. Um, and then, of course, everybody is, it can feel free to visit our, our website, pendulumlife.com, uh, where you can find out about our latest research and any of our products and services. Yeah, it's a fun website. I send all my patients to it. I actually pull it up in my office and you know shove it in their face so uh, they ha they have no choice but to, <laughs> but to hear about you and your fine company i'm i'm that impressed and well uh, we're we're very pleased to, to to hear that and especially pleased to hear about the positive effects that that our products are having are having this is for us obviously our our key mission all right well thanks again for joining us and folks pendulumlife.com that's where to go and use Code Gundry at checkout for 20% off. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. It's time for our audience question. Bpar23 from Instagram asks, how is olive oil any different from sesame oil? Can you explain what attributes of sesame oil block LPSs that olive oil doesn't have? Well, it turns out that, of course, olive oil is a whole lot different than sesame oil. Uh, they have total different fatty structures, but unfortunately, research has shown that uh, LPSs, those lipopolysaccharides, can travel on chylomicrons, which is how almost all fats are transported across the gut wall. And LPSs can hop, hitch a ride, on chylomicrons to sneak across the gut barrier. Now, olive oil is carried with chylomicrons across the gut wall, as is sesame oil. The only one that isn't carried across, interestingly enough, are medium chain triglycerides, MCTs. They are not transported with chylomicrons, and so Believe it or not, LPSs can't hop on MCTs. But research, human research, shows that taking sesame oil blocks the inflammatory effect of LPSs. In fact, a very good human trial shows that with people with hypertension, taking two tablespoons of sesame oil a day actually lowers their blood pressure dramatically and stopping taking the sesame oil makes their blood pressure go back up, a human trial. So it's not so much that both could carry LPSs across, 
but sesame oil signals a blockade by our immune system to not be interested in LPSs when sesame oil is around. Uh, so that's how it works. All right, uh, review of the week is hi, Hayes Ree from Apple Podcasts. Hope I got that right. Save my life, exclamation point. I have suffered from multiple autoimmune issues for my whole life. When I was a child, they went undiagnosed, and it was just assumed the pain I felt was from various injuries from sports. I did a primal diet nine years ago and really healed myself. I was amazed at the impact that food has on health. Unfortunately, being a vegetarian, the, am the amount of time and effort needed to sustain wasn't possible with two small children. I never forgot the healing power of food, though. Three children later and 50 pounds overweight, I was feeling sicker than ever. I knew something had to change, and I found Dr. G. Six weeks in, and I'm already down 18 pounds and feel amazing. My joints are no longer swollen, and I have so much energy. Dr. G makes starting and following the plant paradox as a vegetarian or anyone so accessible and quick. I can do it with no stress, and I could not be more grateful. Listening to the podcast while food prepping and cooking is now my favorite way to spend my me time. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I see this in my patients every day, and that's why I still see patients six days a week. But it's great to hear from someone who, you know, I've not met, I'm not taking care of you, to do this on your own. And quite frankly, we've, we've seen that about 90% of people with autoimmune diseases who uh, embark on the Plant Paradox program, their autoimmune disease goes into remission. And, and it's wonderful to hear from you. So please, uh, if you like what you see, write us a note, respond on wherever you get your podcasts, on iTunes, and let us know. And hopefully I'll be reading your note. And we're doing this because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. See you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.